All right, it's time. Um, I just sent you guys a link. Uh, I received this link from a conference and uh, they were talking about how to use mathematical models to model uh, the epidemic of uh, the, the coronavirus, which is going on right now. So you're basically seeing top researchers talking about how CDC, how, how they use mathematical models to predict how many people is gonna get affected. Okay, so this is basically what people use at CDC and any other organizations to predict how deadly the virus is gonna be. Okay, so if you're interested, feel free to read it. And if you find anything interesting or you find any questions, feel free to talk with me. All right, um, any questions from homework, writing products, or old lectures? Aaron. For the writing projects, um, is it one person has to turn in, in for the whole group or does one, every person has to turn it in? One, one person just do it for the group and then I will see actually okay. a submission with all the three names and then if I grade one of them, everybody will share the same grade. Okay. Yeah, just do it. Don't worry if there's anything, go, uh, if anything went wrong, we can fix it. All right, uh, Nick Peterson. Uh, yeah, um, for the writing projects, uh, project one and two are due this Saturday, right? Yep. Is it the same group then for one and two? Actually, it's the same group for all the writing projects. Oh, okay. Some of you, yeah, some of you guys actually brought this up yesterday, which was really interesting. So I was trying to assign the group as writing product. And why create those kind of things on canvas? They, they gave me writing project group one, group two, group three, and group four. That's how they name it. But then it become confusing because you will also be confused with it. Does it mean the project one or does it mean product group one? That's why yesterday I went in and changed every name to be writing project group one. Then from now on, it will be the same group for all the writing projects. Okay, Justin. I have one from uh, web work. Which one? Uh, 3.2, number five. five. Let's see. Three point two, number five. Differentiate this one. All right. So first, whenever you see something like this, if they didn't specify any variable other than the independent variable is going to be assumed to be a constant. Okay, so this is basically very similar to this. It's just they're doing it for general constant. All right, with that in mind, we just need to apply the quotient rule. Now ask yourself, what is the derivative of ax plus b? Well, if b is a constant, the derivative is zero. If a is a constant, the derivative is one times a. So, technically you can stop here. So I just go ahead and try to simplify it because I want to type it in web work, it's better to be uh, short. And then I realized great news, they cancel each other. That's roughly what I got. Oh, Nick. Yeah, so I had a couple of questions. So for the writing project, I tried contacting my group members and one of them still isn't responding. 
Uh, and for those really kind of things, just send me that. an email about the logistics. Yep. And then I will actually respond uh, individually. Okay. And then I was still confused on 3.1 number 17. Three point one, number seventeen. This were the tenant. Okay, so did we go over this before? In this class, I think we did, but I had different values, and I was just getting cool confused then. on the. Simple yeah, so time. I'm just going to do it re really quickly then to get uh, the number. Okay, you want to find where the tangent line is horizontal. What you need to do is y prime. And there is no shortcut, so. Yes. I think it's minus 17. Ah, uh, that's gonna be a hard number. But still doable. Mm, hold on. Zach, okay. Uh, what we have here is uh, 48 times 17, so. I don't think there is any way to simplify this any further. So you probably want to use a calculator and you should have two answers, one for plus, one for minus. Okay, so use a calculator to find x1, x2, and then use them to find y1, y2 by plugging x1, x2 into this. That's roughly, um, how to finish this one. Cool. All right, any other questions? Okay. Our grand plan, power, check, quotient, which is rational, check, exponential, check, trig, now check, um, radical, which is the inverse of power, check, now we're still missing log and we're missing trig inverse. Okay. These two will be handled using inverse differentiation. Now f plus minus g check, f times g, f divided by g check. Now the only thing missing is f circle g. Okay, so we're missing two more things. Today we will be handling this, f circle g, and that is called the chain rule. Basically we're handling the derivative of sine x square type. Well, what's this? It's pretty easy. It's a combination of sine x and x square. And let's call this one f. Let's call this one g. And I know f prime and g prime. What's left is just try to combine them together and get the final thing for this combination. Now, what do we know so far? We know if it's f plus g, pretty easy. If it's f minus g, pretty easy. If it's sin x times x square, it's product rule. If it's sin x over x square, it's quotient rule. 
good so far? Now you see, this one does not belong to any of them. This one is not a simple sin x and x squared combined by plus minus dividing more times. It's combined by a function decomposition, which means I actually put sin x and then I put x squared here as my variable. That is going to be written as a composition, which is f gx, where I take the gx as the input of my fx. That's what we mean by function composition. Composition. And today we will be handling this. Sounds good. Some quick examples, right? E to the sin x. This is the composition. Uh, e to the x and sin x. You plug sin x into the x of e to the x. This is a combination, a composition. You have something x to the cube but you replace x by some other function, which is x squared plus two. Okay, we will be handling this. Then how do we handle this? Well, let's, let's write down the relationship between these three things. Number one, x, you apply gx, you got the gx. gx, you apply fx, but you apply fx on gx as a whole thing, you get fgx. Still okay? Now what's gonna happen if you change, you, you care about the changing rate, the change, right? Then from here you can see the change of x will lead to the change of g, which will eventually lead to the change of f circle g. Still okay? These two has a changing rate. That is dg over dx, which means the ratio of the change of g divided by change of x. These two are going to have a changing rate. That is gonna be df over dx. Still okay? But now if you think about, again, the input of this one is not x, the input of this one is gx. So what the changing rate here captures should be, should be how much f is gonna change if, not my x, if my gx change a little bit. This f prime here is gonna capture that. Does that make sense here? For example, think about sine x squared x goes to x square goes to sine x square. The derivative here is 2x. What does it mean? That means dx square over dx is 2x. That means if x change by a little, x times this is gonna give you the change of x square. Still okay here? Great. What's the derivative here? Well, the derivative here is cosine x. But really, if you think again, the change of this is not caused by x directly. The change of this is actually caused by the change of x squared. Make sense so far? So instead of saying, hey, this is my df over dx, what I really should say is, this is my change of this divided by the change of this. But because x also caused the change of this, therefore this one is caused by the change of x from the beginning but it's caused implicitly because you have a bridge, you have a connection in the middle. Make sense here? Okay, so this one is gonna have another one, which is d sine x squared, but not according to the change of x, but according to the change of x squared. So if x change, x squared change this much. Now if x squared change, sine x squared change this much. Now if x change, how much this one change? After a change in x square, we should really multiply these two together. That's what we're having here. Make sense here? 
if we put a number, let's say this, if the changing rate here is two, the changing rate here is three, what do you mean by that? That means if X, if X change a little bit, the thing in the middle change by double the size, right? That's what we mean by changing rate is two. Now, if this thing change a little bit, this thing triple the size, but this thing doesn't triple the size of dx. This thing triple the size of already doubled, which give you a six dx. From here, you can see you should multiply really these two numbers together to get the final ratio from the beginning. Sounds good? That's the idea. That is called the chain rule. So let me write it down. The first one is straightforward. What's the derivative of f circle gx? Well, first, first, x change cause g to change. Then, then g change cause f circle g to change. And we, we multiply them together. Another way to write it, the derivative of this is going to be the derivative of G times the derivative of F if G change a little bit. And the reason we put things here is because for the second function f, the input is not x. The input is gx. That's why we need to put gx here. Sounds good. Let's try the example. Of course, we can follow the formula. fx is this. Gx is clearly this, okay. sine x. F prime is this, P prime x is this. Now sine x square is nothing but F gx prime, which is F prime gx times g prime x. g prime x is just this, easy. f prime gx, well, this is f prime x. But this one tells you, you should not put x here because your input is literally gx. So instead you should put this one there. This is how we apply the former. Again, this is just for the first round. You need to write down what is F, what is G, what is F prime, what is G prime. Later, you don't have to write any of these once you get familiar with this. Okay. That's actually a pretty easy argument and it's a pretty easy to former, a follow former. It's just long to write down. So how do we think about this indirectly? Well, personally, this is how I do it. Let's see if this one makes sense in your mind. You were trying to do this, right? There are two functions. First, x goes to x squared. Second, this one goes to sine x squared. Here I apply a function which is called fx. Here I apply the function which is called sine x. But the one I put x squared into x, I got sine x squared in general. Still okay? Now when I take the changing rate, what's the changing rate here? 
That should be cosine x. Okay. What's the change in rate here? That's going to be, oh, that's x squared. That's going to be 2x. And actually, they really multiply them together. Still okay? Now, do you see that? If you really want to use this, this one starts from here, ends here. Therefore, your x should really be replaced by this x square here because you're not touching x yet. That's going to be the next step. Still okay? So that's how I do it. I go forward. When I take the derivative, I go, back, I go backwards. This is step one. This is step two. Step one, I use cosine, okay. but I don't do x squared yet. Sounds good, because my arrow ends here. So I don't do that yet. To show people, I just keep that thing here. I haven't done it yet. But then, I do it in the next step. That's how I get this. Sounds good. All right, let's try some examples. How do you handle this? It's still the two function, but this time the order is changed. I do sin x first. I do x square later. The derivative here is 2x. The derivative here is cosine x. Then, then the first thing I should handle is just this 2x. But wait a second, my x is actually sine x. It's here. The sin x hasn't been done yet. The second. And from here, you can see switching the order give you totally different answers. Take a quick look. Try to see the difference. Okay, questions? It's pretty clear. All right, then let's try more examples. Now we're gonna do things quickly. For every question I write down, it's gonna be a simple chain, okay? We are gonna give you 30 seconds for each one. Try to just use whatever way you feel comfortable. First one is sine, let's don't do sine. Let's do e to the three x derivative.
Sounds good. Okay, e to the x is easy. Changing x to 3x, it doesn't change much. You just need to times the side effect by chain rule. From here, we can see we apply tangent last. So when we do the tangent rate, we should do the tangent first. For tangent, we have second square. Just keep in mind, when you do this, you didn't treat the cosine x inside. You think it's just one variable. Therefore, you need to times that. Now, up to now, tangent is done. What about cosine? We do it in the second step. by a simple multiplication. Feel better? Okay, let's do more. What about this? Looks all right. Let me rewrite. 
write this. Aaron. Um, for that, is it all right if we write the like the one over x and x to the negative first power? Totally. Uh, to the negative okay. first. Yes. Totally. Totally legit. Uh, yep. And then the other one would be negative second. So let me see to say this. Make sure. Yep, they're equivalent. So I would take either answer. Anton. Um, this might be a silly question, but if you have something like x to the fourth within a square root, um, could you simplify that to x squared, or do you have to use chain rule? You mean this? Yes. Why don't we try both? That's one way. Mm-hmm. All right. Do you think they are going to give you the right the the same answer? Probably. Right. It should be. Otherwise, it's seriously wrong. You need to remember which one which way to do. Now, if you think about it, this, looks fancy, but really, what you have is two, which is x squared times four x cubed. Okay, sweet. Sounds good. Yeah. I would personally say if you can simplify before you do the derivative, definitely simplify it because doing derivative is more complicated than doing algebra. So you probably want to make the job for a derivative a little bit easier before you do it, other than do it and then mess up with the algebra. Okay. That gave us a very interesting question. I remember it was Zach or was, I don't quite, yeah, I'm not quite sure, but uh, I received a question from your web work, remember? Something like this, uh, how to do, right, something like that. We were talking about how to do this. Well, we just offered you two ways before. The first one is just to simplify it, you got 25 X to the fourth minus 100 X squared plus 100. That's the first way of doing it. You first foil everything out, then you take the derivative. This is, we only use the algebra and the power rule. Okay. Second, we said we can also use the product rule because this is technically this times that. And we do know product rule. 
We do the derivative of the first one, keep the second one, and then do the derivative of the second one, keep the first one. which give us 100x to the cube minus 200x again. So you can see both way, we have the same answer. And this is done by product rule. That's what we had in class before. Good so far? Now we know we have a third way. What I see here is a function composition. I want to use the chain rule instead. First, I deal with x squared, which give me two x. Still okay? But then I need to actually times the derivative of the inside according to the chain rule. Now I have negative 10 x squared minus 20 times negative 10 x which is 100x cubed plus, something is wrong, what is wrong? This is a plus, so this is minus. This is done by chain rule. Now, Anton, back to your question, which one is correct? You should be confident from now on. As long as you apply the right rule, no matter which way you do it, you'll always receive the same answer. So personally, you should have a personal favorite. Like you always want to try product just because you love that rule. Okay, but it, there's really no restriction how you should approach a problem. As long as you follow the rule and it's correct, you always get the right answer. Sounds good. From here, you can probably see chain rule is longer, but just take a simple example. That is, what if I change this to be a cube? Do you really want to foil everything out using a cube formula? That's gonna be really, really difficult. Okay. Or do you want to split it into the product of three things and do the product rule? It's doable, but it's gonna be long. However, if you change this to be a cube, or even change it to be 300, the answer is gonna be 300. This one, 299 times times negative 10x by the chain rule. Make sense so far? So in general, chain rule is always the easier one simply because it can handle such, it, it is way and way more flexible than the previous two, okay, with such complexity. All right. That's all the easy ones. Let's try a harder one. Take a closer look. This one has two compositions. You have a 4x, you have a tangent x, you have an x to the cube. Each one has a derivative. Make sure you put them in the right order.
All right, we have three functions. A quick assessment, you should have this type of diagram, which tells you, you first went from x to 4x, then you put a tangent on that, you get tangent 4x, and then you cube the whole thing after you get the tangent 4x. That's the right order. Then you know when you try to take the derivative, you actually should go backwards. That means first you should handle this x to the cube. That's easy. That's going to be 3x squared. OK. But when you do that, what did you do? You basically treated tangent 4x as a whole thing because you just care about the x to the cube. This is the thing you cubed. You better keep it and then do the derivative of the inside later. Now you finish the first part. Now you want to do tangent 4x. This time, should you handle 4x or should you handle tangent? Well, the diagram tells you the second step should be going from here to here. You should be able to handle tangent. To handle that, you need second, square. But again, you treated 4x as a whole thing. You better times the derivative of 4x when you finish. Finally, the derivative of 4x is 4. Here, you treat x as x, and you figure, it, well, I can stop there because it's already x. It's, there is no composition anymore. So this is almost like a chain reaction. OK, A implies B, B implies C, C implies D. All right, and when you try to decompose it, you need to figure out the change from C to D times the change from B to C, and then the change from A to B. And finally, you need to be careful because when you go from C to D, your input is C. When you go from B to C, the input is B. So your input is also changing. That's why we call it the chain rule. Does everything make sense here? Okay. If that is okay, try the final one, the final challenge. Okay, see the structure carefully. Give it a try.
All right. It's almost time. So if you're okay with everything I presented here, feel free to leave. If you still have questions, feel free to stay. Aaron? So for what I work, I just have a clarifying question for 3.2 number three. Um, it says five. EX. Hold on, just let would that just let me uh oh. open it up. Three. Yeah, my computer is slow again. 